I'm Shane Morris. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. Our theme for this year's Wilberforce Weekend was, Is Christianity Still Good for the World? Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, we present historian and author Jeremiah Johnston's talk, Did Christianity Make the World Better or Worse? Johnston is the author of Unimaginable, What Our World Would Be Like Without Christianity. I should mention that in several spots of the talk, Johnston refers to various slides for the conference audience. Thankfully, his descriptions will give you a good mental picture, so you should be able to follow along quite easily. Here's Jeremiah Johnston, as introduced by Warren Cole Smith. Dr. Lennox made a powerful case that Christianity and science are not, in fact, incompatible. In fact, he made a powerful case for Christianity being good for science and that many of the most significant scientific breakthroughs in history would not have been possible without the foundation of a Christian worldview. Our next speaker, Dr. Jeremiah Johnston, makes a similar argument, except he applies it to all areas of life. He says Christianity has been responsible for breakthroughs not just in science, but in all areas of human existence. His book, Unimaginable, is one that we at the Colson Center have embraced very closely in the last year. It's been a great book. We've offered it to our donors as a donor premium. It's just a, a book that we have found very nourishing. And it's one that we're selling in our bookstore today, and I strongly recommend it to you. But rather than take up any more of your time with an introduction of Dr. Jeremiah Johnson, you can read about his bio in your book. And uh, let me welcome to the stage now Dr. Jeremiah Johnston. Thank you, Warren. Let me encourage you right at the outset to pivot your chairs so you can see the screens. We're going to have a lot of fun in the next 25 minutes. We're going to be reading some inscriptions, a papyrus fragment. We're going to do a little archaeology as well as we answer this question, has Christianity historically made the world better or worse? Well, what is an undeniable fact of history, and I believe the greatest evidence for the Christian faith today that will resonate, resonate with your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, is the undeniable historical fact that Christianity has been a force for good in our world. The evidence, friends, is just simply overwhelming. And yet, if you listen to the voices that are emerging right now in culture, you're going to sense, and I sense it, and I'm sure you sense it, a growing, undeniable hostility towards the Christian faith. I mean, Pew Research released a results of their poll that stated a great majority of atheists and agnostics, 63%, listen to me, believe the church today contributes nothing to help solutions for the great societal problems. Friends, that just simply flies in the face of the facts. And what I want to propose to you today are two principal points, and I hope that you will write these down. I want to leave you with these. Number one, the church, unified and mobilized, is the greatest force for good on the earth. In fact, part three of my book, Unimaginable, What the World Would Be Like Without Christianity, documents, and we can measure this much more than just simply saying, God bless the world with the church. We can actually measure the undeniable impact that Christianity is making today. But point number two has a certain resonance for me this morning. The gospel of Jesus Christ, when followed, make sure you get this down, will always be in conflict with society, culture, and contemporaries. Let me say that one more time. The gospel of Jesus Christ, when followed, will always be in conflict with society, culture, and contemporaries. This is the great legacy of the Christian faith. Do you remember the city that Paul the Apostle spent more time ministering in than any other city in the Roman world? It was the city of Ephesus, the second largest city in the Roman Empire. What you may not know about the city of Ephesus is that for 200 years during the birth of nascent Christianity, the early Jesus movement, Ephesus was the slave market capital of the world. And when you think that Saul, who became Paul, began his Christian mission with the message to the Galatians in Galatians 3.28, saying this very powerful passage that in Jesus Christ, 
There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. We are all one in Jesus Christ. Can you see him saying that in your mind's eye in the city of Ephesus, home of the Roman slave trade? And don't forget the Roman Empire was much more than a slave economy. It was a grinding slave machine. Caesar's Gallic Wars actually created a million slaves. Why? So he could pay for his war campaigns. It was a slave economy. 40% of the Roman empires were slaves when Paul made that audacious claim. I think of other great saints who have come into conflict with society and culture following Jesus. Think of Polycarp, that second century bishop. If you've been to Turkey to the modern day city of Izmir, that's where Polycarp ministered. And do you remember when Polycarp was martyred for his faith? They said, bring out the atheist. Of course, he was called an atheist because he didn't worship or deify the Roman emperor. Bring out the atheist. Do away with him, the destroyer of our gods. Reminds me of Pliny the Younger. He's writing to Emperor Trajan from Pontius, Bithynia. And he says, I don't really know what's happening. Our temples are crumbling. No one's coming to temple anymore. They are in ruins. We can't stop the Christian movement. Everywhere and in every society, Christianity was constantly coming into conflict with society, with culture, and with contemporaries. And yet when we see what's happening today in the Christian movement, as we celebrated last night with Rick Warren's message, it is an exciting time to be a Christian. Richard Bauckham gives a lower number in an Oxford University Press book. 70,000 people a day are coming to faith in Christ, but you have to look at the footnote. The majority of the growth of the church is not in Western countries. The church is becoming winded, extinct. Why? Because most believers have never got beyond their Sunday school understanding of the faith. We no longer have a thinking faith. We've not followed the command of God to love God with our heart, soul, and our mind, and we have an empty-minded church. And friends, this should not be because I'm an optimist. You and I are living in the golden age of Christianity right now. Do you realize that? There is more evidence available to you as a follower of Jesus than at any other time in the history of our church and our faith. It's simply overwhelming. And yet, I want to introduce you uh, to why I wrote the book, Unimaginable, What Our World Would Be Like Without Christianity. Um, My wife and I, by the way, you're not seeing, well, you are seeing triple in this photo. We have triplets, and I want to point them out to you. Audrey and I uh, have Lily Faith, who's 10, Justin, who's 7, and then our triplets, Abel, Ryder, and Jackson. And when I think about them, first I get burdened because I think that our children and our grandchildren are going to grow up in a world none of us could have ever imagined. We have to train them like Lois and Eunice did to young Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.5, they passed on a legacy of faith to their young son and grandson, Timothy. I take my responsibility very seriously to pass on a legacy of faith, and I know you do as well. But I want you to remember Ryder right here in the top right. I'm going to close with a personal story about the collision of worldviews that I've actually never shared in a public setting. I have my wife's permission to share it. Uh, But when I think about the world they're growing up in, I wanted to write a book that would simply answer the question of the atheists, the agnostics, the secularists, who wish that religion would just go away, but especially Judeo-Christianity. And my response to the secularist who says that is, you may get what you want, but you may not want what you get, if you know what I mean. This is fascinating to me when you study when the church ceases to be in conflict with society, when the church is absorbed by culture, when the church grows breathless and anemic and you can no longer tell the difference between the church and culture, guess what happens, friends? The church dies. We see this in the latest census that was released in Britain. Christianity fell in Britain Get this, the attrition rate, 5.3 million ex-Christians in the last 10 years in Britain. 
That's an attrition rate of 10,000 a week. I have a huge passion for the UK because we lived there for a time during my research. I love what Jesus Christ is doing still in the UK, but yet the church by and large is dying. In fact, I want to show you a picture of our favorite pizza place. Uh, This goes back about 10 years. They're still in business. If you read the sign carefully, uh, this is a church um, right opposite Great Clarendon Street in Oxford. And it's a church where everybody just simply died. And the church went out of business. And oddly enough, uh, and by the way, that's my picture right there on the right. Great pizza at this place. Freud is the name of the restaurant now inside this abandoned, what was an abandoned church. Still very popular, still in business 10 years later, by the way. I think of the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 10, as I put the work together for unimaginable. And there arose another generation after them. Who's them, by the way? The Joshua generation. Who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Friends, Bible students, within one generation, spiritual decline led Israel and the people of God into complacency, complacency to apostasy, and then outright rebellion against God. My challenge for you and my prayer, honestly, for all of us leaving Wilberforce Weekend is that we will apply John 1 and verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Catalumbano in Greek, it actually says, the darkness cannot tackle it or take it down. Friends, we only need to let our light shine. And here's the truth. When you read on in the book of John, chapter 1, it says, we are ministering in a world that loves what? More than light. It loves darkness more than light. I pray that you will make the commitment to let your light shine and know when you do it, when you pierce the darkness, when you don't allow your faith to be absolved by culture, you will see great works for God. On page 75, after living in this book for three years, I wrote, it's a slippery slope when God is sidelined, Christianity is marginalized, evil reigns. Let me give you my own footnote to my quote. Without God... In societies where Christianity is rejected and marginalized, it's much easier to kill people. It's much easier to enslave. It's much easier to eliminate rights in societies where Christianity is marginalized. And friends, every time history repeats itself, as the adage says, we pay a higher price, don't we? I'm praying that the church will wake up. When I think again of the legacy of the great church, think of the Didache, mid-second century collection of teachings of Jesus, not part of the canon, but a work that was inspirational in second century Christianity. This will preach, friends, if you need something to preach on Sunday. Those who persecute the good, who hate truth, who love falsehood, who do not show mercy to a poor person, who are not distressed by the plight of the oppressed, who do not know him who made them, who are child murderers who destroy what God has formed. Is Christianity pro-life? Flip three chapters earlier where the Didache in the second century says Christians should never commit abortion period. The church came against this injustice again and again. So what does society look like without Christianity? I'm going to share three moments in time. My book is loaded with statistics and examples and lists for you readers out there. There are 35 pages of eight-point font, single-spaced notes in the back to undergird my arguments, but I just want to summarize it. You can count on six things. If you go to countries today like Cuba, China, other places and countries where the Christian faith is marginalized. By the way, have you seen the edited Bible of the People's Republic of China? My wife, Audrey, and I have a heart for Christian mission in China. We've been to Beijing. We've ministered with the underground church. But the People's Republic of China has actually released an edited Bible that has deleted the Ten Commandments. Why? The government cannot get behind the First Commandment. Do you remember the First Commandment? Thou shalt have no gods before me. It's fascinating. So you can count on this, both in late antiquity, the world in which the Jesus movement emerged, all the way up to modern time, you can count on inequality, moral relativism. Humanity is dehumanized. 
survival of the strong and the aggressive. It becomes law of the jungle. If in your worldview there's nothing special, as Peter Singer said, you are not made in the image of God, then the law of the jungle applies. There is no concept of individual freedom. The great courses professor Rufus Fears was fond of saying, concepts of individual freedom emerged in one place and one place only, the Old Testament, Judeo-Christianity and its values. No purpose, no ultimate meaning. Shane Morris here again. I hope you're enjoying Jeremiah Johnston's presentation from this year's Wilberforce Weekend. I wanted to let you know that we have Johnston's book, Unimaginable, What the World Would Be Like Without Christianity, available at our online bookstore at breakpoint.org. Of course, every purchase you make there will help support our work at the Colson Center. Again, that's at our online bookstore at breakpoint.org. Now back to Jeremiah Johnston. Here's the first snapshot from modern history. In just the last 70 years, more than one half of the world's population turned its back on God. This is a propaganda poster. You recognize the man. Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, one people, one region, one leader. And it was Adolf Hitler who, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, November 1918, because it was lucky, you know, was laying in a hospital bed as a German corporal, and news was brought to him that Germany had been defeated. And he later said glowingly of himself, it was in that moment that he said he would restore the honor of Germany. Hitler, who was a high school dropout, was homeless at one time in Vienna, drank deeply, though, from the well of Machiavelli. And you remember keeping Machiavelli by his bedside, what Machiavelli said about power. Power was the one universal value, power, and power with no morality. Of course, he drank deeply from the well of Nietzsche, deeply uh, from the well of Machiavelli, deeply from the well of Darwin. What's fascinating, though, to me is in 1937, Hitler called for the actual elimination of Christianity. He actually had the church question. By the way, we know how Hitler answered the Jewish question. And it was in this time that the church did not capitulate. The church contended with society. There he is, the great professor Ernst Kassemann. He died and he lived well into his 90s. But it was in 1937 with Gestapo in his church that Professor Kassemann stood up And he preached this text, knowing that Hitler had called on the destruction of Christianity. Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but your name alone do we honor. Don't you love the boldness, friends? Christianity will always confront culture that is anti-God and anti-faith. Of course, Professor Kaseman was put in prison. By the way, if you want a cryptic comparison, remember Martin Heidegger, the great philosopher of the 20th century, raised, actually thought he was going to join the priesthood, became an, his philosophical, logical end brought him to atheism. So Martin Heidegger had no problem joining the Nazi movement, something he never apologized for to his dying day in 1976. What a clash of worldviews. Of course, you'll recognize the, the picture of the Nuremberg rallies, 1934, to think that when Hitler joined the Nazi movement, there were just seven members. Cryptic, though, is this song. And by the way, if you want to know how deceived Christians can become, there is a Ph.D. doctoral dissertation unpublished from 1960s University of London, a sociography of the SS officers, where this fantastic piece of work shows. Do you know who made up the SS? These were the cream of the crop intellectuals of the day in Germany. Lawyers, bankers, and as the PhD thesis shows, clergymen. One minister who oversaw thousands of executions later said he did not break the law of love. Do you see how deceived we can become as a church when we blend with society? But it was at this Nuremberg rally that the Hitler Youth would sing this song. We are the joyful Hitler Youth. We need no Christian virtue, for our Fuhrer Adolf Hitler is ever our mediator. 
No pastor, no evil one can hinder us from feeling as Hitler's children. We follow not Christ, but horse vessel, kind of a Nazi brown shirt martyr, away with incense and holy water. The church be taken away from me. The swastika is redemption on earth. It will I follow everywhere. Baldur von Schirach, take me away. And von Schirach, the leader of the Hitler youth, did take them away, many of them to their death. I need to say for just 60 seconds something about the Fab Five who created this intellectual environment where racism, eugenics, mass murder, by the way, all in the full scope of the 20th century, the great age of democracy. Hitler would not have been possible in the days of the Kaiser, friends. It's fascinating when you think about how corruption we can become. Now, when I say the Fab Five, I don't mean the Fab Five Michigan basketball team. I mean these five thinkers who should be credited for, they should get all the credit for moving the world away from a Judeo-Christian motif. Many of these thinkers today are practically deified in philosophical departments around the world. Ludwig Feuerbach, Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Of course, it was Feuerbach, I want you to know, who said, Now, it's not as it is in the Bible that God created man in his own image, but on the contrary, man created God in his own image. Now, I would agree with him with all the other gods of the Roman Empire, but not of the Christian God. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, the soul of soulless concisions, das ist aus opium, I have it in German, des Vox, the opium of the masses. By the way, his famous quote is not original to him. Marx had no problem with a very free hand using other people's material. Freud and Nietzsche profoundly influenced Western culture. And I want to just say this again, and I go into this at great detail in part two of my book. Nietzsche laid the groundwork for destroying a nation's soul. Freud discovered ways of destroying your individual soul. Of course, it was Nietzsche who said that eugenics was appropriate. And this is scary to me when I take a moment and apply it to our life, how quickly Nietzsche could talk about the loss of the right to live. Don't you hear that echo today? Don't you feel like Nietzsche's ghost is still at work? God is dead, of course, the most famous statement from philosophy. Eugenics comes from a Greek term, friends, that Plato loved. Eugenis, well-born. He talked about keeping the precious metal of Greek pure, and we see this again today at work. Of course, Freud, not all men are worthy of love. Freud wrote in 1930, if I love someone, you have to deserve it. Well, what did Jesus Christ say? We love our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us and spitefully use us. And of course, we see these, as Professor Lennox said, we see their imitation today in Dawkins. I was speaking to a group of students of Florida Gulf Coast University in January. Friends, I may have mentioned this on the webinar. It sticks with me to this day. A young man walked up to me and they said, Dr. Johnston, I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy to be loved. I am unlovable. Have you ever had anyone say something like that to you? I was stunned. And yet, when university students are listening to the secular humanism that is at work in their classes, that in their life there's no design, no purpose, no good, uh, no evil, just blind, pitiless indifference, we see why suicide rates are at an all-time high today. Why wouldn't they in their life if, as Peter Singer said, there's nothing special to their existence? And so what do we see? There were things about the Christian faith in late antiquity in the time that Jesus came on the scene, that simply were irresistible in the Roman Empire. Doctrines of racism laid aside. Innovation of charity and justice. Gender equality embraced. Crucifixion games ceased. Dignity of human life taken to new levels. I want to pause and I want to end right on time. And I want to talk about the way in which the Christian movement greatly impacted what we might call today family planning. Now, we're going to read an inscription together, and if you go to five and a half on the ruler here, inches, and you go over to this, to this tear right here, this is a letter from Hilarion dated to the first century B.C. He's a migrant worker writing to his wife, Alice, 
And this is first century BC. It's a wonderful love letter, by the way. He really misses her. She's going to have their child before he returns. And he writes this in Greek. Eon, ein, phileia, ekbale. If it is female, throw it out. If it's a boy, keep it. If it is female, cast it away. And nobody would have batted an eye in the time of the early Jesus movement. Why? Because we hear this in Sophocles. And, and um, men, don't get any ideas by any of these quotes. I'm just quoting, women's best jewel is silence, as Sophocles said. A woman must not practice argument. You can't think for yourself if you're a woman, Democritus. Uh, what about, again, friends, we just simply move too quickly past the pages of Scripture. We don't do, as Tom Wright said, we don't read the Bible with first century eyes and we miss the impact of its meaning. When Paul writes to Phoebe, by the way, the only place we see Phoebe mentioned in the New Testament is right here in Romans 16.1. He calls her a leader in the church of Cancrea. I ask you to receive her. He's writing to the churches at Rome who will receive the book of Romans Receive her in a way worthy of the Lord. Give her whatever help she needs. And he writes in Greek, a hapax legomena, the only pace this Greek word pops up in 138,000 Greek New Testament words. She is my prostatis. She is my benefactor and the benefactor of many others also. And you know what's fascinating about Phoebe? It's not like Amazon. You know, does Amazon leave stuff in your garage and just walk away like at my house? When Phoebe is currying the letter to the Romans, 400 miles from where Paul wrote it, she doesn't just leave it at the doorstep of the churches. She stood in Paul's place, and she presented the book of Romans to the church leaders at Rome. Do you see the power of that, knowing something of the context? Can you see her? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. It's powerful So when we look at the centrality of women in the life and ministry of Jesus, it's nothing short of astonishing for that time. Rabbi Judah, under whose leadership the Mishnah was compiled, said there's three benedictions we should say. Blessed be he who did not make me a Gentile. Blessed be he who did not make me an ignoramus. And blessed be he who did not make me a woman. Paul emerged from this explicit Jewish chauvinism when he gives us Galatians 3.28. Better to burn the Torah than teach it to a woman, Rabbi Judah said. So now we're going to have fun uh, reading an inscription. This is the Sophia inscription in the Museum Publique, and uh, actually in Jerusalem. Phoebe is so well remembered in the life of church, though she's only mentioned in one spot in the book of Romans. This is an inscription, the earliest Byzantine that we have discovered actually at the Mount of Olives. Here lies the servant, the bride of Christ. You see Christos right there, second line. Now I'm going to the third line here. Sophia, do you see that right there? The lunate sigma, Sophia, the minister, the second Phoebe. I have a daughter, Lily Faith, and my prayer is, Lily, pray with me that God will make you a second Phoebe, a leader who will confront society with the beauty of the Christian message. It's powerful. This is a brand new one just discovered in 2017 in Bethsaida, another second Phoebe, a church that has its, as its patron. And friends, we just simply can't appreciate this. Do you know who the greatest evangelists were in the first century Jesus movement? Women. The church stopped female infanticide. The ch- where there were 64% of the church was women in AD 80. They just kept evangelizing. This is why Paul's talking about marriage to unbelieving husbands. It was a real deal in the first century. In Greek, set up by your servant, Susanna. I don't have time to share Misty's story. It's in the book about her experience at Dunkin' Donuts in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. But I do want to close with this very brief story about the collision of worldviews. Audrey and I were unable to get pregnant for five years, so let me just give a disclaimer. Please be careful what you pray for, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) God is a big boy. 700 diapers a month is my reality right now. (laughs) Thank you for buying the book at the table. (laughs) So I, I want you to have the context that for five years we were unable to be pregnant, and we had a baby. Lily Faith, then Justin, and then God kept going. We're like, Lord, you can stop now. 
we went into the sonogram to, it was like a substitute sonogram technician that day. He didn't have much charisma, like the charisma, no offense, of a substitute school teacher. He went A, B, C, one, two, three, and I thought, is he singing a Michael Jackson song? And he said, no, you have three babies, baby A, baby B, baby C. To make a long story very short, it took us time to get into a maternal fetal medicine expert at a fantastic hospital, Texas Children's Hospital, where we're based in Houston. In our first appointment, I invited my mom to join us because I just wanted to make sure we heard everything right. No one would talk to us. People acted scared that we were having triplets, so it made me afraid. Within the first five minutes of the appointment, our doctor walked in with an ominous look on her face, and she said, two of your twin, or two, you, have two, you have identical twin triplets and one that's non-identical. So Jackson on the far left is not identical. Ryder and Abel are identical. And she said, Ryder and Abel are sharing a placenta. Ryder's pulse is always lower. He's not going to live through the pregnancy. It's unlikely. It's likely he will develop TTTS, twin to trend transfer syndrome, where he will hoard the nutrients from his brother not only killing him, but also endangering your life. And friends, we're hearing this in the first five minutes, and she looks at us, and she says, now we can offer a fetal reduction. And, you know, some people come, this is an international city, some people don't want triplets, some people don't want any babies. Now we can take, she starts going through the menu. We can have one fetal reduction, two, or all. Now, I just want to say something. You talk about a cultural euphemism, a fetal reduction. I would not believe it had I not heard it with my own ears. Of course, my wife took over, a spirit-filled, godly woman. I, I said nothing. And my wife, who's amazing. Amen. Amen, Audrey. My wife said, doctor, and she said the name, we will trust the Lord. And I got really bold, like Paul did, about asking people to pray. Audrey carried those boys to 33 weeks, and friends, they were born way too healthy. They have too much energy. (laughs) We haven't slept in three years. I'm sorry to be four minutes over. Uh, Thank you all for listening. I hope to meet you at at the table in the back. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. I hope you'll join us every weekday at the Breakpoint Podcast for our Breakpoint commentaries, special presentations, interviews, and our weekly roundup show, Breakpoint This Week. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.